Welcome to the Rock Ag Podcast. This is your host, Gary Coffey, Ag and Natural Resource Agent for the University of Kentucky in Rockcastle County. Today, we'll be joined by Dr. Greg Halich, Forage Extension Economist for the University of Kentucky. We will be discussing his recent article, How Hay Became a Four-Letter Word, in Hay and Forage Growers Magazine. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Halich. Um, I am going to talk to you today about how hay became a four-letter word, an article that you wrote for Hay and Forage Growers Magazine. I thought it really hit home, and a lot of times I think in our cattle operations, especially in my area, we feel like that the best thing that we can do is to sell our hay equipment and quit baling hay. And I think that this article really hit home with uh, why that's not a good idea. So we appreciate you joining us today, and we'll uh, kind of get into it. And the first question that I want to talk about is where did the thought come from that no hay is best? Where, where did that idea come from? Well, there's there's probably many different places that originated. I, I like to say there, you know, there's an academic side of where that came from, and then there's kind of the popular press side of where that came from. Um, and on the academic side. You know, there there was some just what I would call very basic analysis done, just looking at average grazing costs and um, and average haymaking costs, and just based on that simple analysis, there you know there are some forage specialists that basically conclude that you shouldn't make hay; you should just keep grazing until end of March, early April, and uh, and that'll give you the highest profitability and. Uh, um, without going into a lot of detail, it just, you know, it was, it was just very basic analysis and it, and it really just applied for kind of a, a typical grazing season. And, um, and I like to say, just like with most things, too much of anything kind of can be counterproductive. So in other words, if you're, if you're stocked really heavily and you're feeding a lot of hay, yeah, kind of reducing the amount of hay that you're feeding initially is going to be profitable, more profitable than feeding, say, 150 days of hay. But at a certain point, um, that that change in profitability keeps going down. At some point, it's going to go the other way. So, in other words, you go beyond a certain point, and your profitability actually starts going the other way. So, you're you're losing profitability, and you're heading back in the direction you came. Um, then, on the kind of popular press side, of, you know, there's very well respected grazing specialist and author, Jim Garish. Um, I know Jim well, um, I've actually had him here at my farm before and have a lot of respect for him. He wrote Kick the Hay Habit and uh, basically advocated that most farms will probably would be better off profitability wise if, if they feed next to no hay. Um, he wrote that book in 2010 and um, I, my first year in the cattle business was 2006, and, and for the first half a dozen years, I, I basically was a stocker operator. I'd buy calves in the spring, sell them in the fall. So, you know, it's, it's a margin business, but but I guess the reason I'm telling you that is I know very well what I was paying for those calves every year, you know, just because I was buying a bunch of them. And those, basically 2006 to 2010, that, that just co happened to coincide with some of the lowest calf prices we've seen even if, if we kind of adjust that for inflation probably in the last 20 years. So in other words, at that time with, with really low calf prices, um, his message that feeding next to no hay was, was probably very valid. In fact, I, I would go on the record, it was valid just because if, if you're making, essentially, or if you're losing money on a bunch of calves, which people probably were during that time, the more of them that you produce, the more money you're losing, right? So if, if you can go from that system to, having fewer cows, but making a higher profit per cow, even though you're gonna sell fewer of the calves, uh, you're a lot better off. So I like to say it was a really good message at the time. And probably for a lot of farmers, it's still a good message if, if say they're feeding 150 days of hay or more. But again, once you kind of get in that moderate range, let's say that's three months or so, um, that's a whole different ball game than, than what it would have been say in 2010. Okay. I know I read an article by Kevin Laurent back, it's been probably six months ago, but he said being moderate in an extreme world. And a lot of times I, I think about that and I feel like that that's what you're telling us is that, you know, the extreme either way, we don't want to be feeding hay six months, but then we also probably 30 days is going to be a little extreme on the other side. So 
you know, being being in that moderate category, I think is is the key to success in a lot of situations. Yeah, and, and it's a good way of putting it. And, and then I guess all we need to kind of decide on is what what's a good definition of moderate, right? Right. And that's probably what you want to focus on here, is my guess. Yeah. So that was that's probably going to lead into my next question is that, you know, what advice do you have for finding our point of balance between grazing and feeding for our individual situation? There's no cookie cutter definition I know that's going to suit everybody. But whenever I look at my farm or, you know, the, my producer's farms that I'm trying to help out, what are some keys that we're going to look at to try to figure that out? Yeah, and like you say, it's, you know, we can't give one correct answer, one answer that's going to fit everyone. It, it will vary from farm to farm. It will also vary by the market. Just like, you know, we talked about 2010, that was kind of area an era of, of extremely low calf prices, which correlated, obviously, to extremely low cow-calf profitability. Um, I like to use example, if, and I'm I am not saying that I expect this, but if, for instance, we expected the next five years to be like 2014. And in 2014, you know, most farmers were selling calves for, for close to 250 pounds. I actually bought some steers, I remember in 2014, for 274 pounds. Yeah. Um, I, I hopefully I wasn't the high end of the, and I, in other words, I sold, I bought them. I didn't sell them, Garrett. I, I bought those steers. Now they were good steers. They're were, they were already weaned. They had their shots, everything, really good genetics. Um, so they were worth it at the time. But my point being is if we knew for sure, or we expected the next five years, you're, let's say you're a cow calf farmer and you expect the next five years to sell calves for 250 pound, the answer to how much hay you should be feeding would be very different in that situation than it would today, where let's say you're expecting to sell those same calves for dollar forty pound or dollar fifty pound. In other words, if we if we're in an era of really good calf or cow calf profitability, we can afford to feed more hay, right? Versus if if we're kind of in a normal era or maybe a little bit below normal era. So it really depends on the market. But but that said, you know we got to be realistic here where, you know, we might occasionally get a year like 2014, but as we found out that usually lasts a very short time period. We're very good at starting to overproduce when, when profitability looks good, not just on the grain side, but kale also. So that's kind of the caveat is it, it really depends on the, on the market. It also depends on your cost structures, individual farm. And let me give you an example. Let's say we're in the same calf market where we've got two farms selling calves, you know, wean calves for $1.50. You might have one farm that has a very high cost structure, another farm that has a very low cost structure, everything else kind of the same. That farm that has that low cost, that low cost structure is gonna be more profitable than the other farm, right? So in other words, that farm can actually afford to feed more hay than the other one. So when I say, you know, low cost structures, everything except for their hay cost, throw that out. But all their other costs, that low cost farm, they can afford to feed more hay because their profitability is higher than the other farm. Just like when calf prices are really good, you can afford to feed more hay than when those calf prices are low. It's really just overall profitability. Um, so that said, if, if we just think about the average kind of cost structure on, a, on an average farm here in Kentucky in the current market environment that we're, we're both in and are likely to be in for the next five years, um, I, would, I would say that for most farms, probably somewhere between two and three months of hay feeding is going to be their most profitable kind of balance point. Yeah. I think, I think that that's you know, from my experience with working in extension and my own personal experiences, I, I feel like that that's probably attainable, pretty easy. Uh, you know, if we if we're got a pretty good system of uh, grazing system and a pretty good system on our hay, then I feel like that that's that's a pretty good place to be. Is kind of my feeling as well. I do, and I think I think three months is a whole lot more attainable for most farms than two months, or because every month you start going down from there is a whole lot more. Uh, a whole lot more difficult. Uh, Virginia Tech has a program. They've been doing this for a few years now. They call it Grays 300. So it's, it's a program they're pushing for reduced hay feeding, uh, trying to get down to that 300 days of grazing. So that would essentially mean two months of hay feeding, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I keep joking with them. They need to change their name to Grays 270, but they keep telling me it doesn't sound nearly as good. 
And, and so I guess what I'm saying there is it's nice to, to shoot, you know, it's, it's nice to have a target to shoot for, for, let's say graze 300 days. But if, if in the end, all we're, we'll get to 270, which would be, you know, three months of hay feeding that that's probably about as good in most situations. And it, and it can even be more profitable in some situations. So, yeah, I know that, that we see, you know, obviously weather has a, a huge determining factor in that, you know, a couple of years ago, it got really dry in the fall. Well, all of a sudden I was feeding hay in September whenever usually I can stretch it out to November. So, you sure. know, like you said, I think, I think that, thought of I'm going to try to reach this goal, but you know, if it turns off to be a drought, then we can't reach that goal. Well, I mean, we just have to plan on that ahead of time. That's right. And we don't have control of that. So when I say 90 days, I mean, on average year. So obviously yeah. that means on a good year with lots of rainfall, you might get to 60 days or maybe 50 days, but yeah, you have a mild drought and it may, it's going to be 120 or so. One thing I read in your article that I thought about was, was very uh, interesting is that you said that you had someone come up to you that, you know, said that they were planning on, on no hay feeding. And, you know, then it's like, well, what if you can't reach that goal? Well, I mean, you've got to have a plan in place that if it does come a drought, I mean, you've got to have some kind of backup plan for sure. Yeah. And the specific instance you're talking about, I mean, I remember it well, it was you know, a fairly young farmer and, um, he, he was kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. I mean, you know, you talk about Kevin Laurent saying, you know, there's, there's a lot of extremes. And I, I think of grazing in, in terms of the, number, the farmers I know and, and being usually on, on one of the two extremes, most of them, either they're feeding a lot of hay or they're trying to feed no hay. And there aren't a whole lot of people in between like you that are trying to get that balance point. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, that, that particular, you know, young man, he, you know, he had been told by people that most profitable number of, or hay feeding days is getting down to zero and but it was obvious that he he was not anywhere close to doing that with his stocking grade or anything but he just thought you just force those cattle to grub those pastures down a few more days and and you know that's an important point you know as you well know you can stretch a few more day, grazing days on about any farm right but you've got to balance that with what there's a cost or you know that your cattle the performance is going to start plummeting when when you push them too hard and you've, so in other words, when I say 90 days, that's 90 days of, of or that's 270 days of grazing where, where you're not pushing the cattle down on grub pastures. Yeah. I, I know farms are feeding, you know, maybe 120 days of, of hay a year when, when really they should be feeding 180 days. I'm not saying, you know, they need to change your stock rate, but in other words, there's nothing for those cattle to eat about 60 days out of the year. I've got one right across the road from me. And yeah. it's, it's terrible to watch because you know that, I mean, the cattle are not doing well. They're starving half to death during that time period. You know, I think about, I think about the no hay plan. And also I, I recall back to mid February this year when we had an ice storm. And I mean, if you didn't have hay, I mean, those cattle couldn't graze. I mean, yeah. for about three days, I mean, it would have been nearly impossible for them to get anything to eat at my place anyway. I think all over Kentucky. Yeah. I, I mean, I had, I've got poly wire, you know, rotating the cattle through through my bale grazing, and and I had I had about two thousand feet of poly wire that I had to take a uh, just like a stick and start beating it to get the ice off because it was it was dragging to the ground. It was yeah. uh, it's kind of fun to talk about now, but at the time it wasn't so fun. That's absolutely absolutely. So we we've, we've discussed stocking rates quite a bit, and. You know, that's something that I feel like that's that's extremely important that it is 100 percent based on your farm and your management strategies, I think. And, you know, everybody I hear everybody say, well, you can pasture a cow and calf on two acres. Well, I've got some places that I could probably do better than that. I can probably get down to maybe an acre, acre and a half to pasture some cows through the summer because it's highly productive in grass. I also have some places that it's probably going to take four or five acres you know, some rough hillside, shallow topsoil that's not very, you know, productive. So I think that, you know, there's no, there's no set standard for us in the state of Kentucky as how many acres per cow and calf pair. I mean, you agree with that? Yeah, I completely agree. And for the same reasons, you know, all soils are not created equal. All, all farmers are not created equal in terms of management. Yeah. 
makes a big difference. Like you're saying, are you on steep hillside pastures that have four inches of topsoil and rock underneath them? Or, or do you, you know, are you on good flat uh, ground that has two feet of, of good topsoil? Um, are you talking about a farm that's just doing continuous grazing? Or are you talking about a farm that has, you know, reasonable rotational grazing where they're, they're getting a whole lot more pasture growth on that same farm as, as if they had continuous grazing? So right. it makes a big difference. So, you know, whenever I think about that, whenever we look at the at the broad spectrum is, you know, we've got to have, you know, they people base it on two acres per cow. But then you also have to think about that, you know, there's probably going to be depending on your situation, and this is just a, a random number, but probably you're going to have to have two more acres to produce hay for that cow on throughout the winter, whatever it may be for your specific situation. Yep. So all of a sudden now we're looking at, you know, instead of the thought of two acres per cow, it's like, oh, well, there's, you know, you got to have those acres for the hay as well. So, you know, whenever we look at that, and this might be an abstract question, I don't know if it is, I'm sorry, but, you know, in, in a, situation where we say okay we're going to have to have four acres for this cow and you know we're going to do two acres of pasture and and two acres of hay well can we decrease that hay can we can we think hey let's decrease the the amount of hay we're producing so we're going to put her on three acres of pasture and only cut an acre of hay to try to get her down to to shorter grazing or shorter hay feeding days is that a feasible thought yeah i mean that that's only what what you know, just about every farmer is going to, that trip that they're going to have to make is, is to decide on that. And um, so, yeah, again, that's one reason why I personally, I hate throwing out number of acres per cow that you should be, because just as we talked about, it makes a big difference in terms of the soil, the management of the farmer, yeah. all that stuff. So again, in the end, I like to say whatever it takes for you to get down to say around 90 days of hay feeding, that's what you need to do. So if, if you can do it in two and a half acres, Great. If it's taking you four acres of pasture to do that, that's what you got to do. Right. So in other words, based on your management, your farm, et cetera, you're going to have to figure out what, you know, how many cows that farm can support to get down to roughly three months of hay feed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like that that's a, that's a great goal in mind is to get to that. And, and like you said, I, I feel like that there's, we got two extremes. There's either somebody that's really pushing it, really decrease their stocking rates to get down to, you know, 30 days, or we've yeah. got somebody that's, you know, cutting, cutting hay just to be cutting hay, I guess, yeah. <laughs> you know, they yeah. love driving a tractor, I guess is, is, and that's okay. You know, what that's, we need some people like that. Right. Right. Exactly. I, what, I buy my hay. So I, I want some people like that. So. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, and that's something that I, I've tried to balance too, is that, you know, we, we have a lot of our farm is fenced that I can graze it. And so sometimes I feel like that I might be a, a little better off to be purchasing hay to feed, you know, and, and to supplement. Do you have any numbers on that? And I'm sorry, I've thrown this in on you, but, but as far as like purchasing hay compared to bailing hay, how do you feel about that? Yeah. And that could be a whole <laughs> yeah. different top, top right. or talking topic here, but let me just say this, because you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to go so, too far down that rabbit hole because okay. we might not come out. Um, but we need people that are, I, I, you know, there's some people saying you, you know, you, you shouldn't make your own hay, you should buy it. But the problem is, someone's got to make that hay. Right. Um, what you said is probably accurate. We just have a lot of people out there for whatever reason love making hay. I mean, I made a lot of hay when I was young, and I, all I can say is I, I've made enough hay in my lifetime where it's not going to hurt me one bit. I'm not going to shed a tear if I don't make another bale. Absolutely. Um, but we need people to make it. And let me just say this. If if you want to make a profit on the hay side of your operation with the amount of equipment that you have. So let, let's say you feel you've got to have either all new equipment or something close to all new equipment. You're going to have to run enough hay through that equipment to justify it. Right. So in other words, if, if you've got really good equipment and you're only you know, you, you're only putting up a couple hundred bales a year. You're, you're, I can tell you your depreciation overhead costs are going to be too high for your operation to, to ever make a profit on the hay side. Um, so what we need is, is people that are making a lot of hay with good equipment and people like me, they're willing to buy that at a fair price um, to compensate them for doing that. And in the end, we both can benefit. The guy I buy hay from, he's benefiting because he's running more hay through his equipment 
I'm benefiting because I don't have to have hay equipment. And in the end, I can I can buy my hay for my small operation a lot, a lot cheaper than I could producing it um, if I if I had to have fairly new equipment. So okay. Do you have any last words of advice for us whenever we think about this? Uh so again, it's it's going to vary by the specific situation, but I really feel strongly for most farms. If you can get down or on an average year about three months of hay feeding, you're you're right in that sweet spot. You know, it might be sixty days, maybe a hundred days, but if you target ninety days, that that's going to put you in that in that area where it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. Okay. Well, that's great. We appreciate you joining us today, Doctor Halich. Um, we look forward to visiting with you again sometime. All right. It's been my pleasure. Good to talk to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Rock Ag Podcast. If you have any questions on the content of this podcast, please contact Garrett Coffey at the Rockcastle County Extension Office. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share our podcast.